Hello and welcome once more to Your Faith Questions. Your Faith Questions is a segment where we get to discuss some of those faith questions that you may be having. Um, this is part two of a, conversations, of a conversation that we have been having on the Bible. Um, if you've not watched part one, kindly um, just check it out on our YouTube page. Um, and today, again, I am joined with a senior pastor and we just continue with this conversation on the Bible and whether it can be trusted. So welcome back, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, last time you ended, uh, or rather in the, in the first part, you ended by uh, telling us that the Bible is reliable. And one of the things you mentioned is its internal consistency. But one of the questions I have is, if you say the Bible has internal consistency, what about issues that look like contradictions? within the Bible itself. Doesn't that beat the very thing that you're saying? So for example, if you look at the life of Christ, especially the resurrection, when you read the different gospel accounts, they seem to give different scenarios, you know. Um, so if we just quickly look at that, for example, Matthew um, uh, says, chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. All right, so we have an angel of the Lord, rolled the stone, sat on it. So that is Matthew. When we come to Mark, Mark chapter 16 when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. In Matthew, the angel rolled back the stone, sat on it. In Mark... The stone is rolled, but they enter and find a young man, you know, sitting on the right side. Then we come to Luke. And Luke, um, chapter 24, says, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Right now, it's two men. <laughs> yes. And finally, John. John... Chapter 20, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they had laid him. So Peter went out to the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple turned Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there. Now in fact, there is no person now here. Verse 11. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. All right. Okay. So we, we could agree then that <laughs> John and, uh, and Luke, Luke agree that there were two, uh, yeah. because Luke mentions, you know, and there are two men that were seen, and now Mary Magdalene, you know, sees two angels. Um, the order seems a bit off, at least when you look at the book of John, because first Mary Magdalene dashes to get Peter and John. But how do you explain, you know, that which might seem like a contradiction? And there are many others that people have tried to point out. I just wanted to give this yeah. as an example. I, th I think very, very important, because uh, some of these have been picked up, especially by people of other faiths yeah. uh, or atheists, to try to point out that the Bible is actually uh, contradictory and therefore inaccurate. Uh, the Bible is not like, uh, say, uh, 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 
the book of uh, some of the people of the other faiths, where uh, they have a, a doctrine called abrogation. And the doctrine of abrogation says that where there is a, something that appears to be a, a contradiction, the latter version mm. uh, overrules the former. Uh, okay. So whatever the former had said, yeah. uh, it is overruled by the latter. Yeah. Now, we do not have that in scripture. Uh, all scripture is authoritative, is God-breathed, uh, God yeah. and is profitable uh, for teaching, for doctrine. Mm. Now, uh, in the narratives, the gospel narratives, you will find, and this is not the only uh, occasion, mm -hmm. you will find a number of uh, 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 stories that one would begin to think of uh, and uh, say, hey, they're different here. Uh, the genealogy of Jesus, for example, uh, you come to the genealogy of Jesus, look at it from uh, uh, Matthew's point of view and look at it from uh, uh, Luke's point of view, and you begin to see uh, 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 they go all the way to David, and then after that mm -hmm. they start changing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they, they are quite different. And one begins to wonder, uh, uh, why are they contradicting one another? I think there are two, uh, maybe three elements that we can use to uh, make a response to this. The first element is that uh, when we examine those texts in themselves yeah. and try to put them in uh, an orderly manner, uh, we will find that actually what appears to be a contradiction may not necessarily be as much of a contradiction. Mm. Uh, the agreement that uh, generally will come around, especially the, the tomb narrative, uh, is that uh, uh, there were two angels. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a main actor, uh, and uh, there were two angels. Uh, I would recommend a book called Who Moved the Stone? Mm. Uh, a book called Who Moved the Stone? This individual who was a lawyer actually has attempted to uh, uh, just take the incident one by one, one by yeah. one, and go through that whole period of time. And uh, uh, when you read that book, you come out to the other end, you begin to discover that actually you can explain uh, quite a number of those uh, narratives. Yeah. But the second thing that I think I needed to point out for us is uh, this is a reporter's version. If uh, an accident took place mm. on the road, yeah and uh, you and I uh, were going to make reports. Mm. Some of us will try to concentrate on what we picture. I may concentrate on car number A. Mm. Uh, you may concentrate on the person who was wounded, and you may speak a little bit more about the person yeah. who was wounded than I. And the reason that is, is uh, according to the audience that we are writing to. Mm. And the biblical writers all had audience that they were geared towards. Yeah. Matthew, very uh, Jewish oriented mm. in terms of his writing. Yeah. While uh, 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 Luke, uh, uh, the only Gentile writer yeah. in the whole scripture, and mm. writing to Theophilus, mm. uh, this Roman ruler, to convince him about the reality of Christianity. Yeah. So he's very detailed in terms of his account. Mm. He, he, he brings in lots of details. Uh, so that is helpful for us when we are reading the gospel yeah. to know that uh, uh, actually uh, in the writing of the gospel, uh, maybe I need to mention this, I'd said we should not be, uh, uh, I think we should not be uh, too uh, academical, but in, in, in the writing of the gospel, it is important for us to know that the first gospel to be written was the gospel of Mark. Yeah. And after Mark wrote his gospel, Matthew and Luke borrowed a lot from uh, the writings of Mark, mm. because they were writing when already the book of Mark was in circulation. Yeah. Uh, and so they used quite a number of things from the book of Mark. Mm. Uh, so where they deviate from Mark is coming out of what Luke says in uh, uh, the beginning part of his book. After having done research mm. and consulted with some of the people, yeah. I took upon myself to write to you an account, O mm. Theophilus, yeah. of the things that you have had. In other words, Luke is saying, I've also done some research yeah. on this, so I may yeah. deviate from the Mark record, mm. but it's coming out of my research. Yeah. Because Luke himself was not an eyewitness mm. to all the things that took mm. place. He was mm. actually an investigator, yeah. a historian, but a medical doctor who mm. was actually quite a great historian. Now, we need to take those into account when we are thinking of the alleged biblical uh, discrepancies. Mm. So you'll find some narratives where, was it one person, was it two people, mm. uh, who was writing, who was he writing yeah. to. Uh, you'll find, uh, 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 I've mentioned the genealogy which uh, 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 one is following uh, uh, 
Mary's genealogy. Yeah. Another one is following Joseph's Joseph. gene genealogy. Yeah. Uh, but if we do not have all those things in the background, uh, mm. we will see that the Bible actually mm. uh, contradicts itself uh, uh, when it may not be so, mm. if we take time to uh, study it uh, yeah. uh, in details. Yeah. I think the other thing that I need to mention is, uh, 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 this is important for, for, for me to bring out, uh, is that uh, when it comes to the Old Testament, particularly two of the books of the Old Testament, uh, uh, the Book of Kings, and the book of Chronicles, you will find a few uh, mainly figures uh, that are not corroborating. Mm. It's, not, uh, uh, it's, it's not the data, mm. it's the figure. One may say 7,000, another may say 70,000. Mm. Uh, uh, you may find that when you read uh, 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 the book of Kings and uh, the book Chronicles. of Chronicles. Now, it's important for us to understand that Chronicles is written much, much later after the events. As a mm. matter of fact, many people believe Chronicles is written by Ezra, mm. which is a post-exilic uh, uh, narrative. Yeah. So he's writing after the events have taken place. He's looking at records. Some of the records are not there. Some of the records are there. And so if there are some figurative figures uh, in terms of disagreement, uh, I don't think they are sufficient enough uh, to bring mm. doubt mm. to the authenticity of the Bible. Oh, wonderful. So in other words, what you're saying is we that are believers at least, uh, our response when we approach the scripture is to come with a disposition of trust. Yes. And so where we meet what may be alleged contradictions to know that they are not contradictions per se, because scripture does not contradict itself. I think it's uh, good to put it this way. For now, I may not be able to explain or understand this, mm. but when I get full knowledge, yes. this will be uh, true and genuine and authentic. In other words, it will not contradict itself. Oh. Uh, just the proposition that I made yes. a little earlier on, yes. at the very beginning mm. in our last uh, mm. uh, session, mm. that when uh, everything is known about the original autographer, yeah. Yeah. and uh, it will be found that the Bible is true mm. in whatever it says, whether mm. that is in mathematics, mm. whether that is in biology, mm. or whatever else it mm. says. Yeah. All right. Could it be then what? Probably Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. That's right. Wonderful. That's right. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. It's so encouraging to know that we can actually just trust even the contents mm. that we have of the scripture. And this questions that just keep coming our way um, to know that even when we may not have the right answers in the moment, that we can still trust the author. But the other thing that I wonder, um, you, you mentioned the Septuagint as a, as a translation from Hebrew to, to Greek of the Old Testament. And then later, I think it is Jerome um, that did the Latin Vulgate. Then later we had people like Wycliffe doing the English Bible. But now we have, especially of the English Bible, we have so many translations. I don't know what translation are you using. I prefer New American Standard. New American Standard. I have the um, English um, Standard Version, and, and sometimes on this particular show, I have the NIV. Yes. Uh, why do we have so many translations of the same Bible? I, I, th I think it's important <laughs> to note that uh, translations uh, uh, become necessary, especially now that we are talking about more of the English translation, mm. uh, in order to make everyone have a Bible in a language that they can be able to read and understand. Yeah. There are still several communities all over the world who do not have the Bible in their mm. own languages. Mm. So efforts are being made to bring the Bible in their own languages. Yeah. Those who already have the Bible in their own languages, uh, even now, uh, uh, translation efforts are being made to just examine uh, is what we have uh, accurate uh, mm. translation. Yeah. And the reason is because language is uh, dynamic. Language is not fixed. Yeah. Uh, a language moves uh, by generation. Mm. There were some things that uh, had a very special meaning in the 18th century mm. or something like that. Uh, but today they mean uh, uh, extremely different, uh, mm. uh, different words. If I use the word gay, in the old English language, that meant joyous, happy. happy. Yeah. 
but you use that word today, mm. it means a totally different thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it is important for us to know that language changes, and as language changes, uh, generations that are living at that particular time need to uh, look to uh, uh, the Bible and bring it out uh, mm. in, uh, 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 in a version that is uh, relevant to, to them. Yeah. I need to add here that uh, not all version versions are trustworthy. Okay. And the reason why I'm adding this is uh, because there are some translations uh, which have been made by some individuals or some groups mm. because they are following an agenda mm. and they have a certain doctrine that they are pursuing. Yeah. I think of a translation, New World Translation, mm -hmm. by uh, 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 the Watchtower uh, group. Yeah. Uh, New World Translation by the Watchtower Group uh, takes certain portions of the Bible. I will take the New Testament. Uh, I will take John chapter 1 verse 1. Mm. And uh, instead of translating that accurately, they actually mistranslate it because they want to achieve uh, an agenda. Yeah. Uh, for example, that portion says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word oh, was God. God. But when they translate it, uh, they put it, the Word was a God. And the reason they are doing that is because they want to deny the whole fact mm. that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is actually divine, that mm. the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, is a part of the Trinity. Uh, so since the Bible says that, the only way they can get yeah. around that is to yeah. mistranslate the Bible. Mm. I think that's one example that I need to give. Not yeah. all translation can be trusted. Yeah. Secondly, uh, more recently we've had a, 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 a clamor for a feminist uh, Bible. Mm -hmm. And so the feminist Bible goes uh, uh, out, uh, feminist-oriented Bible, to be gender-sensitive kind of Bible, yeah. Mm -hmm. goes out to uh, uh, change certain uh, aspects of the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, not to make them relevant to us, but to appease them uh, uh, in order to suit a, a certain culture. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, that's not favorable because uh, mm. then the person reading uh, does not have the sense of the original. Yeah. When a translation is being done, uh, there are two aspects of the translation that one needs to uh, take note of. There are some translations that are more text-oriented, okay. so they are very close to the text. Yeah. Uh, the NASV that I'm reading mm. uh, is more of a text-oriented translation. Mm. Mm. They are good for doing studies yeah. uh, uh, because you get very, very closer to the text. Yeah. Uh, the language sometimes may be a little difficult, but uh, uh, the sense also, the way they put the words, mm. uh, the sentences, uh, uh, sometimes may not be uh, the way we put our normal sentences, mm. but they are trying to be as close to the text as possible. Yeah. Then we have other translations that are reader-oriented. Mm. They are trying to get close to the reader mm. to give the sense of the meaning yeah. uh, as much as possible. The yeah. NIV, for example, yeah. is more of a, a reader-oriented. Mm. Very, very useful when you are doing devotion, yeah. a personal devotion, yeah. because it helps you to be able to uh, understand what, uh, what, you, what you are actually looking at. Mm. And I think uh, 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 that should help us uh, uh, yeah. when we are looking at the issue of translation. Oh, wow. Um, so you've mentioned about, you know, some being text-oriented, others being read-oriented. I've had some, you know, rephrasing that and calling some being form-based yeah. and other being meaning-based. Yeah. And so if you're looking at that spectrum, for example, um, I have heard some of you preaching and one of, um, you know, the books you quote is, you know, Eugene Peterson. Yeah. Um, the message, where would that qualify, for example, when it comes to translation? Is it a translation? No. Okay. Uh, uh, and when I quote it, I yes. quote it as a paraphrase. Yes. Uh, the reason I say a paraphrase, paraphrase is, a, uh, uh, let me go back, translations usually pass through a certain process. Yeah. And the process they pass through is that there are scholars, uh, biblical scholars, who actually are familiar with the original languages, whether Greek or Hebrew. Mm. And these scholars spend time in studying these passages. Mm. They do not study it as one person. Yeah. They study it in a group commissioned mm -hmm. by uh, uh, sections of, uh, uh, of publishers or the church. Yeah. They study it as a group. They go through this section. It is passed to other scholars again who check what they have gone through. Uh, scholars who are not part of that. And so uh, a translation passes through several processes and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, Originally, before the world of the computers, yeah. a, a translation would take up to 20 years. Wow. Uh, 
uh, for one book of the Bible. Wow. Uh, after 20 years, uh, only going through the book of John. Uh, now with the computers, it's get, becoming yeah. a little faster. Yeah. And that was because of the processes that they, it needed to go through to mm. make sure that there is accuracy mm. uh, and uh, it's capturing uh, what actually needs to be done. Yeah. On the other hand, a paraphrase is like me taking my NASB translation yeah. and reading it, then I put it in a language that I mm. think uh, uh, the common people will be able to understand. Yeah. That is a paraphrase. All right. It is different from a translation. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, um, so you've mentioned um, the NASB, I have the ESV, you've talked about the NIV being more reader oriented and very good. Um, for devotions, but one of the fights that at least I have had, you know, people bring about is I'm only a KJV person. Anything other than KJV is not scripture. You know, it has an agenda uh, and should be discarded. How do you respond to that? Uh, KJV, King James uh, Version, was commissioned by King James in 1611. Mm. Uh, that is when it was actually uh, published. Uh, the English that was spoken then was a different kind of English. Uh, uh, the text that it used, uh, manuscript that it used, mm. uh, since 1611, we have been able, some of the texts that I mentioned, John Ryland and yeah. a few others, yeah. were discovered after 1611. Yeah. So they have actually added much more. Mm. And remember the manuscript we said were copies of the original yeah. autographer. Yeah. They have added much more in terms of affirming some of the sense mm. uh, and some of the value of what actually, uh, uh, what do other manuscripts say. Mm. Uh, so 1611 was translated, 11 uh, King James was translated when there was certain manu manuscripts. Mm. We have had more manuscripts that have been discovered. Yeah. I think it's also important for us to note that it is only the original autographer yes. which is inspired. Yes. It is not the translation. Mm -hmm. So the translation is not in, uh, inspired. Yeah. And secondly, the language that was spoken, the English language that was spoken then, uh, is different now. I can yeah. give an example. When Paul writes and says in the King James Version that I long for you in the bowels of the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, that had a meaning then. Yeah. Uh, in, in 1611, mm. it meant uh, uh, the deepest longing of, mm. of, of one's heart was actually the boils. Yeah. And using that to bring that expression to, yeah. uh, to, uh, in, in translating uh, 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 the passages of, 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 of Paul. But today, you say that it doesn't <laughs> mean anything. Yeah. Uh, it, it totally miscommunicates. True. So you need to translate it. Uh, if you are translating for modern day, yeah. you need to translate it in a way that we can be able to understand it. Yeah. That's why we improve the translations uh, mm. as we continue changing uh, so yeah. that uh, 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 each uh, group uh, actually will have the opportunity to hear the Bible mm. in a language that they can mm. understand. Mm. Amen. So in other words, the KJV as a translation is not more inspired than you would say the NIV or the NSB because to if if I if if I got you right that only the original autographer yes is inspired that is right wow wow wonderful and so as we read these translations that we have and as we come towards a conclusion of just this conversation that we have been having on on the bible how would you advise us then to actually study the Bible. We've talked about its authenticity, we've talked about its reliability, we've talked about the fact that actually God inspired the writings therein. So how would you advise us as believers when we approach the scripture, how would you advise us to actually read and study this word? I think it's important for us to uh, note that uh, uh, the Bible has certain rules of interpretation and that uh, we take into account these rules of interpretation when we are reading the Bible. Uh, simply put, uh, three of them are quite important. First of all, there is the rule of uh, history. And the rule of history uh, uh, simply would point out to us uh, that uh, as we look at uh, 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 the background of the Bible, that uh, the Bible comes out in, in, in such a sense that uh, it confirms the historical background that we have had. Mm. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't uh, contradict, it doesn't, uh, 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 there, there, there is the history behind it yeah. that we need to take into account. Uh, and so when you read the Bible, uh, it's important for you to ask the question, what did the author actually mean? Mm. 
Who was he writing to? What did he actually mean? Because if I read the Bible and I say today, uh, uh, what do I understand with it within Nairobi today? Then uh, I will be translating it for today, but I'm not going back to what actually the author meant. Mm. So I may miss a lot by missing what actually the author meant. What did the author actually mean? Secondly, we have the rule of harmony. And the rule of harmony simply says, if my understanding and translation of the Bible actually contradicts another portion of the Bible, it is not for me to question what I'm reading. It is for me to question my interpretation of that portion, that the Bible actually uh, uh, affirms itself. And then uh, 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 the, the rule of history, uh, the rule of harmony, and the rule of simplicity. Now, there are some of us who are always complex. We, we go to the Bible and we say, there is another underlying message beneath it. Uh, there is another code that is behind it. You've got to discover this code. That is when you'll understand the Bible. No, the rule of simplicity says, take the simple meaning mm. first. Mm. If the simple meaning is absurd, that is when you begin to ask yourself, uh, could there be another different meaning that actually uh, we, we have other than the simple meaning yeah. that we are receiving? So how do I read the Bible then? I read it in unity. I read it simply. I read it devotionally. I read it with the mind that it is God's word to me. Therefore, I read it as a love letter that I'm reading as God is speaking to me. And I read it as something that is authoritative in my life because it will change and transform me as uh, I continue to serve God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Indeed. And we have come to the end of our discussion on the Bible. Um, I pray that has been helpful. And if um, you still have you know, further questions for clarification, please send us um, your questions either at the comment section or through media at nairobibaptist.co.k um, and we'll be more than glad to continue interacting with you as we respond to this. But as we come to a close, I'll just like to read for us the words of scripture from Psalm um, chapter 19 from verse 7 to verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And so we pray that that will be your desire as you come to the word of God. Until next Monday, the Lord bless you.